Good morning. Good morning. On an absolutely beautiful day that God has given us, it's just wonderful to see your face here as we gather in the sanctuary of our, our Lord and Savior Jesus, still basking in the glow of Easter. As we look at the theme that brings together all of our worship for this morning, that we see God's amazing love and that Jesus, not only has he suffered, died, and risen for our sins, but this is the Sunday of the church here that we set aside. We give it the, the name Good Shepherd Sunday. The reality of Easter is that Jesus, he does not leave us, but he remains our good shepherd who leads us to the living waters of himself. That is why he has brought you here today to listen to him about the things that he has done for you. He is your good shepherd. So blessings today as your good shepherd brings you to himself and feeds you with the living water and life that he provides. Uh, join with me, if you will, as we begin with our opening hymn, The uh, Lamb of God. If you are able, I invite you to please rise. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him, to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has indeed been merciful to us, and he's given us his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd who laid down your life for the sheep. Lead us now to the still waters of your life-giving word, that we may abide in your Father's house forevermore. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I invite you to give your attention to our scripture lessons. The New Testament lesson is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 20. This is the Apostle Paul. He's on his third missionary journey. He is saying farewell to the spiritual leaders at the Christian church in a city called Ephesus. He reminds them that while Jesus is our good shepherd, he has under shepherds that he has placed in his church, and in that way, Jesus is, is uh, taking care of his sheep. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. If the kids would like to join me up front for our message for today, I'd love to have you come and join me. Good morning. How is everyone doing today? You look handsome, head in the air. There's plenty of room, and if we need to, you can even just yeah, pop on the floor wherever you'd like to go. Use both pews, sit in front of the traffic. It's all good. Uh, I have uh, some of my friends here with me. I borrowed them from Mrs. Arndt's classroom. I was hoping that she had one of those, you know, the little pulley thing that uh, you pull the cord, and then it says the, uh, the, this animal says this and that. I realized that she uses these to teach you phonics. I'm not that sophisticated. Let's see if this works. Do you know what kind of an animal this is? No. This is no. a cow, all right? Now, do any of you live with a cow? No, okay. So we're gonna see if you have become familiar with a cow, all right? Not fancy phonics stuff, but Wisconsin stuff. Here we go. What does a cow say? I will open the cow's mouth at the proper time. I will open the cow's mouth and you tell me what a cow says. A cow says, Moo. You have learned what a cow says. Very good. I also have here another animal. You are correct. This is a pig. I will open the pig's mouth. And when I open the pig's mouth, please make for me the sound that a pig makes. It makes this sound. Yes, you have been around pigs. You're familiar with the sounds that pigs make. Very good. All right. But now I have a picture here. 
And who is this a picture of? That is correct. This is a picture of Jesus. Now, you've shown me that you are familiar uh, with the things that cows say and what pigs say, but I'm wondering, uh, what kind of things does Jesus say? If I open his mouth, what kind of sounds do you expect to come from Jesus? You've gotten to know him. You've learned about him. What kind of sounds would you expect to come out of his mouth? What do you think? Uh, what's that? Yeah, nice words. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus, uh, he reminds us that God wants us to love uh, and would do so with all of our heart. Mm -hmm. uh, kind words? Yes, he's very, very kind. Mm -hmm. And not only would we find words that uh, Jesus talks about being nice and kind, uh, but Jesus always reminds us what is the most important thing that he did for us. You guys know this. What's the most important, even more than being nice and kind, what did Jesus do for us? Absolutely. He died on the cross to take away your sins. And one of the favorite words that Jesus likes to use, they're words like grace and mercy. What, what those words mean is that God has been kind to you. It means that he forgives us, even when we don't deserve to be forgiven. Those are the sounds that Jesus makes. Uh, if <clears throat> I held up a pig and I said, the pig says moo, you would know, yeah, you would know that isn't the pig, because that's not what pigs say. Pigs say oink. And if I held up a cow and the cow said oink, you would know that's not a cow. Today, God reminds us, whenever you hear Jesus, make sure that you hear Jesus giving you the words uh, that he teaches you, like grace and mercy and forgiveness, and that he is the one who takes away all of your sins. Because sometimes people like to change the words of Jesus. So when you listen to him, you've come to know him. And always make sure that you're listening to Jesus, your Savior, who tells you about his love and how he died for you. Can you say a prayer with me about that? Okay. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me Jesus, your son, to be my good shepherd. And I know Jesus because you have revealed him to me. He speaks to me of mercy and grace, and I am forgiven because of him, not myself. If anyone ever tells me something different about Jesus, may I listen not to their voice, but may I listen to the voice of Jesus who loves me and has saved me. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Okay, you listen for Jesus today and the things that he tells you about his love for you. If you are able, I invite you to please rise for the words of the Good Shepherd Jesus from John chapter 10. Pastor Arndt and myself, we are under shepherds of the Good Shepherd Jesus. We care about you and try to care for you, but our care and concern is imperfect. Thankfully, you have a greater shepherd whose care and concern for you is perfect. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life. For the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. The word of the Lord.
You may be seated as we join together in the hymn of the day.
our epistle lesson and the basis for our sermon meditation on this Good Shepherd Sunday from the first epistle of John, chapter 4. Dear friends, John says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood, the word of the Lord. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed. In the south of California, uh, there is a fascinating piece of real estate, uh, which is called uh, the Sultan Sea. It has a fascinating history behind it. Uh, hundreds of years ago, it was a large inland salt water sea, but it dried up. It remained a dry lake bed, uh, salty, desolate, for centuries until around the year 1900 uh, when it was given a new lease on life and it was entirely by accident. The Colorado River flows nearby and there was a dam on the Colorado River meant to bring irrigation to farmers in the area and the dam failed. And so this parched uh, land that had been a dry, salty seabed for uh, at least hundreds of years for two years, it enjoyed the gift of fresh, living water. And it was filled up once again. And it started to change everything. Uh, people flocked to it in the 1940s and 50s. It became one of the premier vacation destinations in Southern California. It was peppered with businesses, resorts, and vacation homes. All of the trappings of 1950s and 60s resorts. Uh, and people loved it. But there's a saying, bad leadership can transform a paradise into a desert. And in the case of the Salton Sea, those words came true uh, literally. You see, once the dam was fixed, the Salton Sea it was no longer fed uh, by living water of the Colorado River. The water that it received, it was secondary runoff water uh, that flowed through all of the farmlands and collected uh, all of the different fertilizers, pesticides, and things from the area. The problem wasn't water. Water the Salton Sea had, the problem was the type of water that it had, and it was managed horribly. It started to dry up in time because there wasn't enough um, of the water and the salinity, the salt content of the whole thing. Uh, it rose to a level of three times that of the ocean. Fish that thrived there uh, almost overnight because of that living water, those fish, they started to die off by the millions. Uh, all of the caustic chemicals that uh, were being poured in there that didn't have an outlet, those became exposed. And the, the vacation paradise has started to turn into an ecological nightmare. Imagine if you had put your family investment into starting a business or a resort on the shores of the Salton Sea when in the year 2000, the U.S. Geological Survey came along uh, and they looked at it and they said, this is what's happened to it. Uh, they described the smell as objectionable, nauseous, unique, and pervasive. Uh, just death and foul smells everywhere. It is still to this day a popular place uh, for boaters, uh, 
only because the salt content of it is so high that it appears that it gives boats an extra buoyancy. So if you want to set a speed record for a power boat, if you can stand the stench, uh, you go to the Salton Sea, which still has water, very buoyant, foul-smelling water, and you can do that there, but not much else. Uh, it remains to this day the greatest ecological disaster in the state of California, and they've had more than a few. Uh, the thing is, it's not the only disaster of such in the world. Uh, this is the land of Israel, the land flowing with milk and honey that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For a moment, don't dwell on the ecology of Israel, but look at the theology of Israel. What you are looking at here is a desert, just as all of the world is a desert because of our sin. New birth is a desert of sin. But yet into the desert of this world, pay attention to the theology. God provided the fresh living water of his promise of grace. Because in this particular swath of land, God said, I am going to provide the fresh living water of my promise of salvation that I first gave to Adam and Eve a ways away in the Garden of Eden. God called out to a man named Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to go and live there because you know who's going to live there one day through you? One of your children, one of your descendants, Abraham, is going to be the good shepherd who provides the world with the living water of himself. And here, in the middle of a desert, I'm going to provide the living water of Jesus Christ who will be born in the flesh. And when Abraham came to this land, God made it very clear just what kind of a savior he was going to be. You remember what God had Abraham do shortly after his son Isaac was born to him. Just so that you understand how God is going to provide water, grace, and forgiveness, he said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him. God, of course, stops him and says, I'm not going to ask you to do that because I am going to do that. And even though we're looking here at a caricature, a word I can't pronounce, of Abraham and a, a, a vague image of Isaac, this is what I want you to understand. These people were real. These people lived in the flesh. A father stood above his son with the knife raised, ready to thrust it into the chest of his son. Real people, real flesh. Why? Because God promised to Abraham, the living water that is going to come to you is also real. It was in that desert of Israel that God, uh, when the time had fully come, that Jesus was born. And when he was born, life flowed. The thing is, how quickly the water of life, it dried up. Today in the land of Israel, religion is not something which is in short supply. It's everywhere. We speak of the three great religions of the world, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And all of them, notice all of them, they trace their ancestry back to Abraham. The man with the knife raised in the sky. They acknowledge that Abraham was real. Abraham came in the flesh. But one and only one of those religions acknowledges the one that was beneath Abraham, the son that was given to him that was going to be the sacrifice that saved him from sin. And so religion is everywhere today in the land of Israel, but what there is not a lot of in the land of Israel today is the sacrifice, the son, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And not only has much of the world's religions, uh, they keep their Abraham roots and such, but leaving behind Christ. But even with Christianity today, as John speaks to us, he reminds us that there are different spirits in the world, even in the realm of Christianity. 
unless we become dried out and foul-smelling like the salt and sea, John reminds us that even when it comes uh, to Christianity itself, we always have to be on our guard that we are testing the spirits because there are different spirits. There are false prophets. What is a different spirit? Well, a different spirit is a person or an entity that uses words and vocabulary of God, but they do so with an entirely different meaning. Uh, the result, whether intentional or not, is that people are deceived. Uh, a simple example, uh, I've seen comedians talk about this. Uh, what you see here is a country, a patch of land known as North Korea, uh, but that is not uh, its official name. Officially, uh, the, the name of this uh, swath of land is the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. And so the language that's used, the vocabulary that's used, would suggest that here you have a haven for a democracy, a republic uh, where people have rights and privileges, but you know that that is deceptive. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, it is a tyranny. Well, John reminds us that the same thing happens to an even greater exponential degree when it comes to the world of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Even in the realms of Christianity, there will be people who will use the words and the vocabulary of God, and yet they will deny the essence of God, which notice how Jesus portrays it to us this morning with this interesting expression, in the flesh. You see, Abraham was real. His son Isaac was real. But the one who was even more real was the one that they were a figure of, and that is your Lord and Savior, Jesus. And on Good Shepherd Sunday, that means everything to you because you are real. You are in the flesh. I undertook an exercise the other day. I was playing around with um, our church records and the computer program that we have, uh, and I was trying to better understand you, where you live. And so what I did is I was going through our church directory, and there's a neat little feature on there. When and I, I can call up your name, and I can say, show me where this person lives. And, and there it is. There's a little pin that drops on a map. And I can look at that, and I can say, there you are. Uh, that is where you live. But that's not you. You're not a pin in a map, are you? Oh, but I can do more than that. I can look at a house. Satellites have flown over. How invasive that is. I can see, I can see what your house looks like from above. Uh, but that's not you. Because you're not a pin in a map. You're not a house taken from a satellite uh, uh, thousands of miles above the earth. You're flesh. You're blood. At any given moment, I can look at that pin in the map and realize that you are there. You're thinking. You're breathing. Uh, there are things that are going on in your lives. There are things that trouble you. There are things that give you joy. And I want to know what are those joys and troubles that you experience in the flesh. Because pinch yourself. If you have flesh, you have these things. And even with all of our technology, with, with all of the things that God has blessed us with in this world, I can see you as a pin. I can see where you are. I can even see you here today. But yet I realize my limitations in that even as I stare at you, I struggle to understand your flesh. Because I have flesh too. And we're a desert and we're sinful. But John says this is what's different about Jesus, your good shepherd. It's fascinating how John in his gospel and in his epistle is always reminding us, Jesus came in the flesh, real flesh, because he wanted to really know you and be your savior. And your good shepherd does that. Take a moment and think about the things that trouble you, that keep you up at night, the things that bother you about yourself. Your savior knows them and is well aware of them. But not only did your Savior come in the flesh so that he might know you, your Savior came in the flesh so that he might save you. And that's what the Jews couldn't get. It wasn't that they were simply descended from Abraham. They were a recipient of the promise that Abraham received. 
Abraham didn't save himself. He believed in God. He believed that God was going to send his son in the flesh. And when Jesus came, notice how he points out to people, my flesh, it's real food. It's a real thing. You have a real savior. The Jews didn't understand that. In the world of Islam today, uh, it speaks about commandments that are similar to ours and such, but it has completely forgotten any inkling of the real flesh of Jesus Christ and of the idea that God could love you and sacrifice for your sins. And yes, in the world of Christianity today, be very careful uh, because uh, words about God and, and from scripture, those are plentiful, but what is not so plentiful is Jesus Christ preached in the flesh. We'll talk in Bible class today about uh, a particular spirit in the world that John calls the Antichrist. Uh, the Antichrist is an individual or a force that looks like Jesus. It uses the language and vocabulary of Jesus, but in the end, it really denies the power of Jesus. It opposes him and leads people away from the salvation that he provides. And we'll talk about how we were able to understand that uh, as we look at the history of the church, that the office of the papacy and such, uh, that's an obvious manifestation of the Antichrist. Uh, but don't even go there first. Make sure this morning that the first spirit that we test, uh, that we see the living water of Jesus, is the spirit of yourself. Why are you here today? Why have you come? What are you going to do? John says, test the spirits and see if they are from God. Because what does Jesus say? He lifted Abraham up from himself and says, Abraham, believe in me and I will credit righteousness to you because I came in flesh, perfect flesh. And he does the same to you. Notice how God lifts you up from yourself today and says, do not believe in yourself, but this is the spirit of God. Look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the spirit who speaks to you today to love you, redeem you, and give you new life in Christ Jesus. And what does John command us to do with this? Test it. Notice when John uses testing, it's not something that you simply take a little sip of something and then spit it out. It's a word much more involved in that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have a tasting of the Lord and rejoice that your good shepherd is not only come to you, but John says he is in you, in the flesh. And when you find him, commune with him as he invites you this morning to do. And when you do that, do one final thing. John says, confess him. Close with one of my favorite words in uh, the Greek language, uh, to confess Jesus. Um, uh, it, it's a, at least a derivative of it. Uh, homologamina. Homologamina. It's just fun. Say it with me. Homologamina. What it means is there is the, the, the word the word Jesus, and you are homogenous with him. You're just one with him. That's what it means to confess him. Be at one with your Lord and Savior Jesus, who is your good shepherd. Because when you do that, what the world does is it listens to you. Because you are of God. And therein you find a good shepherd. A good shepherd who brings you into communion with himself and leads you to the living water, not of a Colorado River, not of a figure antiquated from the Old Testament, but the good shepherd who brings you to himself. That is why you are here today, to taste and to confess and to be made alive again in Jesus, your good shepherd, who comes to you in the flesh. Thanks be to God. May we live in him. Amen. Join with me as we gather our offerings for the work of our church and the spreading of this good news.
by the congregation to please rise for the thank offering. <clears throat> seated. Our worship continues with the responsive prayer of the church. We keep in our prayers here today, Emily Delaney and Brandon Tharman, uh, united in Christian marriage here at St. John's this past Friday. Also uh, thankful to report to you that John and Christine Martin have declined their call to serve in Algoma, to remain here at St. John's. Uh, we pray for uh, Julio Rivera, that's Brett and Charmaine Kemp's son. Uh, he's being deployed to the Middle East with his Marine unit this next week. And we also pray for uh, Haley Rafke, that's the granddaughter of Nancy Scheinemann. Uh, she's in the hospital right now dealing uh, with some medical issues. We pray. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O oh Christ. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have Gracious Lord, bless Brandon and Emily's marriage with your love and guidance. Help them to always cherish and respect each other, to communicate openly and honestly, and to keep you at the center of their relationship. Grant them strength and wisdom to face any challenges that may come their way, and fill their home with joy. Lord of the Church, thank you for leading John and Christine Martin to remain serving here at St. John's. Continue to bless their ministries among us. Be with our sister congregation in Algoma as they wait for your plan for their ministry to be revealed. Heavenly Father, we come to you with hearts full of both pride and concern as Julio is deployed. We ask for your protection to surround and uphold him in the days ahead. Grant him courage, wisdom, and strength to fulfill his duties. Help him to feel your presence with him every step of the way. Lord, we lift up Haley in prayer. Grant wisdom, skill, and compassion to the medical staff as they work to bring healing and comfort. May your healing touch be upon Haley, bringing restoration and wholeness. Merciful God, Maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. And we join in the prayer that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our worship this morning continues with the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms and placed all things under his feet for the benefit of the church. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. At this time, I invite you forward for Lord's Supper, for all things are now ready.
We join together and thank the Lord. You can remain seated. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received your forgiveness through word and sacrament may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Shepherd of my 
seated. Good morning again, everyone. Wonderful to worship with you here today. Uh, you are invited to stick around for our family Bible hour. Kids will start here in church. Uh, teens uh, with Mr. Payne up in the 7th, 8th grade room. Everyone else is welcome to be down in the fellowship hall. We continue to look at uh, end times uh, issues as the Bible teaches us uh, about this. Please grab one of the bolts and inserts if you haven't done so uh, already. Uh, just a couple of things uh, to highlight for you there. One would be the uh, annual Partners in Education flower sale still going on through uh, next Sunday. So check that out on your way uh, downstairs or towards the elevator there. There's a table there. Um, also, I uh, want to keep in mind if you uh, want those greeting cards, today is the last day for you to, to put in an order uh, for those things. Uh, coming up next Sunday, we do have a voters meeting here at 915 in the sanctuary uh, to uh, approve uh, or going forward with a stained glass windows. So uh, we thank you for the feedback we've gotten already. If you have other feedback, feel free to share that. Uh, one final thing, uh, we are going to do the May Day baskets again here in, in, uh, in Newburgh, spread the good cheer. Uh, if you want to help with prep for that, that's Saturday morning from 9 uh, to 11, I'm assuming the fellowship hall. And then on Sunday, if you'd like to be part of the delivery, that would be after late service, so probably around 11.45 or so. Again, we'll just meet down in the fellowship hall. It's been well received in Newburgh the last couple of years that we have done it, so we'd love to have you be a part of that. Again, wonderful to worship with you here today. May God bless your day.